Prepare for a rude awakening. Shalom, Torah fans. This is Michael Rood in the Golan Heights of Israel, and we are overlooking the beautiful Sea of Galilee. In the final hours of preparation for Passover, Yeshua made his final public address to his disciples and the multitude gathered on the Temple Mount. He addressed the crowd in Hebrew, and Matthew recorded his words in Hebrew. But for the past several centuries, all we have had is the Greek translation of his original Hebrew dialogue, which states, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Whatsoever they command you to do and observe, that do. Modern Orthodox Judaism is a continuation of first century Phariseeism. The observances and commandments of the Pharisees who still sit in Moses' seat have changed little since the time that Yeshua fought with them in their synagogues and insulted them while dining in their homes. The Greek and English version of Matthew's Gospel tells us that Yeshua commanded all of Israel, including his disciples, to obey the rabbis. Yet, in his next breath, he said that these religious leaders were nothing more than whitewashed boxes full of rotting corpses. How are we to understand and reconcile Yeshua's clearly contradictory words and actions? To solve this dilemma, I exhausted every extant Greek text that was published. The Aramaic text of Matthew's Gospel also provided no remedy. So I inquired of a friend who was working as a translator on the Dead Sea Scrolls Project for Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Even though he was not a follower of Yeshua, he agreed to look into this seeming paradox that I presented because it appeared to be a textual contradiction in an ancient text which is his field of expertise. Months passed, and then finally we had a breakthrough that was far beyond our wildest imagination. Tens of thousands of ancient Hebrew manuscripts that had been locked away in a vault behind the Iron Curtain were released to Hebrew scholars in Jerusalem. One of these manuscripts contained a copy of the ancient Hebrew version of the Gospel of Matthew. I asked my friend to address two specific points in his teaching. The first point, which will be introduced in this episode, is that in order to comprehend the implications of Yeshua's alleged commandment to obey everything the Pharisees command us to do and observe, we must know what it is that the Pharisees command us to do and observe. My friend is uniquely qualified to speak on this topic as he was raised in the Pharisaic tradition as a modern Orthodox Jew. His father and his father's fathers for 30 generations have been Pharisee rabbis. He understands Yeshua's conflict with the first century Pharisees because he personally found himself in conflict with the same teachings of his rabbis. He is also uniquely qualified to speak on the ancient Hebrew version of Matthew's Gospel because he was the individual who found a very significant manuscript of the archaic text which he reads with ease and precision. Now, episode four in the 10-part series, Raiders of the Lost Book, Discoveries in the Ancient Hebrew Text of Matthew's Gospel. Ladies and gentlemen, I present from Jerusalem, Dead Sea Scroll Scholar, Nehemia Gordon. It was a few years ago that Michael Rood came to me and he asked me about a verse in the Gospel of Matthew that we're about to look at. And there Yeshua says in Matthew, he says, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. And what Yeshua seems to be saying here is that the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in the seat of Moses, they have some type of Mosaic authority, whatever they bid you observe, whatever they command you to do, that you must do if you're a disciple of Yeshua. And actually I've dressed today as a modern day Pharisee, I don't normally dress this way, 
but I've dressed in the garb of a modern-day Pharisee to illustrate to you what it would mean to obey the Pharisees. You would have to dress according to the traditional Pharisaical dress and follow Pharisaical practices. This is what it would mean to obey the Pharisees. Now, what is this seat of Moses? What's a, what's a Moses' seat? Well, this is a Moses' seat from the ancient synagogue of Chorazin in the Galilee that was unearthed by archaeologists. And the idea of a Moses' seat was that there was a special stone chair in the synagogue where the head of the synagogue would sit and teach with authority. And what Yeshua seems to be saying is that the Pharisees are the ones that teach with authority, so do whatever they tell you to do. You must obey them if you believe and obey what Yeshua says. Here's a Moses' seat from ancient synagogue at Delos. This is uh, from an island in Greece. This is actually the oldest synagogue that's ever been unearthed by archaeologists. And already in the first synagogue ever found by archaeologists, there's one of these seats of Moses, these Moses' seats where the head of the synagogue would sit and teach with authority. And what Yeshua seems to be saying very clearly is that the Pharisees are the ones that sit in the seat of Moses. Whatever they command you to do, if you are a disciple of Yeshua, you must do that. Well, a few years back, Michael came to me and asked me what I thought of this verse. And I explained to Michael that as a, I'm a Karite Jew. Karite is a Hebrew word that refers to Jews who only believe in the Old Testament. And as a Karite Jew, I don't actually look to Yeshua as the Messiah. So my first reaction was, well, I see you have a problem, Michael, but it's not my problem, it's your problem. <laughs> But I agreed to look at this and research this as a textual problem. I have a background in academia. I have a degree in biblical studies and archaeology from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And I've worked in various research projects, such as a, as a translator on the Dead Sea Scroll Reader. So I said, okay, here's a 2,000-year-old text, which doesn't make a lot of sense. There's a problem here. Let's see if I can apply linguistic and textual tools on this, like I would on a problem in the Dead Sea Scrolls or any ancient text. And what really is the problem, though? What, what's the problem? What does it mean to obey the Pharisees? Well, I knew exactly what this meant because I was actually raised as a, as a Pharisee, as a modern Orthodox Jew. Before I became a Karite and Old Testament Jew, I, I uh, was raised as a Pharisee. And one of the things I knew was that to obey the Pharisees would mean to follow rules and regulations that govern every aspect of life, literally from the moment you wake up in the morning until the moment you go to sleep at night. And here's an example of uh, one of these rules and regulations, something that I was taught growing up, I was taught that uh, from the Shulchan Aruch, which is a universally accepted guide to modern Pharisaical living, and there the Pharisees teach that when a person wakes up in the morning, first he must put on his right shoe, but not tie it. Then he must put on his left shoe and tie it and go back and tie his right shoe. Now, do you really think that Yeshua was commanding you to obey the Pharisees tell you to do these things? But that's what it said. That's what it says in Matthew 23. Whatsoever they bid you observe, whatsoever they command you to do, that observe and do. Do that. And it really seems that he's uh, commanding his disciples to obey these rules and regulations that cover every aspect of life. By the way, it gets, it gets even better because another rabbi came along and added some notes to this book, and he lived in a country where they didn't have shoelaces. And he, literally, he explains, even with our shoes, which do not have laces, a person must still put on his right shoe first. Now, if you were going to obey whatever the Pharisees command you to do, you not only have to dress in this manner, but you have to put on the clothes according to specific rules and regulations. And is that really what Yeshua is commanding? Is that what he's commanding you as his disciples to do? Uh, well, when I was having this discussion with Michael, I said, okay, Michael, I, I see this is very inconvenient for you as, as a disciple of Yeshua. It's, like, it's not my problem, it's yours. But other than the great inconvenience of obeying the people that tell you which shoe to put on first in the morning, what makes you think that's not what Yeshua says? Because, or that's not what Yeshua meant. He clearly says that. And Michael pointed me to some verses in uh, the very same passage in Matthew 23. For example, Matthew 23, verse 13, Yeshua says there, he's speaking to the Pharisees, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you that are entering to go in. Now here, 10 verses later, after saying the Pharisees have Mosaic authority, that they sit in the seat of Moses and you should obey them, he then says they shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. So what's going on here? Something doesn't fit. Something, something's not meshing here. Here's another verse. Matthew 23, verse 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You are like unto whited sepulchers, whited graves, whited tombs, which, are indeed, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Now, is Yeshua really commanding his disciples to obey these Pharisees? Whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But, but that's what it says. Now, I still wasn't convinced. I said to Michael, okay, 
Yeshua, what Yeshua seems to me to be saying in the English is that the Pharisees are hypocrites. And because they are hypocrites, they make these burdens and they foist them up upon the nation. Uh, because they have Mosaic authority, they have the right to do that, even though they don't, they don't actually do their own commandments. They make all these man-made laws, but, which they have the Mosaic authority to do, according to Yeshua in Matthew 23, verses 2 to 3. But they don't actually follow these laws themselves because they're hypocrites, and that's how they keep people out of the kingdom of heaven. And so I said, well, what makes you think, what really makes you think that you don't have to obey the Pharisees? And Michael mentioned to me, well, there's another account that seems to be contrary to Yeshua instructing his disciples to obey the Pharisees, and that's the account in Matthew 15 of the washing of the hands. This is a very interesting account that I had come into contact with many years before. Uh, oh, about 10 years ago, living in Jerusalem, I met a very interesting fellow, and he one day revealed to me that he was actually a Torah-keeping Christian. And I had no idea what that meant. I said, Torah-keeping Christian? What on earth is a Torah-keeping Christian? I've lived in Israel for 12 years, but I was born and raised in Chicago. And in Chicago, all the Christians I'd ever met always told me that the Torah is a curse that was laid upon Israel, and Jesus died to set them free from the curse. They're now free from the law. The freedom through... Uh, and, and I said, so, okay, what then is a Torah-keeping Christian? If most Christians are saying the Torah is a curse, why are you keeping this curse? And... He knew I was a Karite Jew, and he knew that Karites, being Old Testament, are very uh, textually oriented. And rather than explain to me in theory, he said, okay, let me show you in the New Testament the actual words of Yeshua that will explain to you what I mean by a Torah-keeping Christian. And my friend opened up to me to Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, and showed me the words of Yeshua himself. And there Yeshua says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass... By the way, are heaven and earth still around? Yes, they are. Okay, that's a good thing. Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And my Torah-keeping Christian friend explained to me, uh, he said, look, you see, it's very clear. Yeshua didn't come to do away with the Torah. Not even the most minutest point of the Torah, the jots and the tittles, the dots and the dashes, even the smallest points of, uh, of Torah, even those Yeshua didn't come to do away with. I thought this was very interesting and, and really very refreshing. This was certainly much better than the Torah is a curse and Jesus died to set them free from the curse. And I said, okay, so this means you do everything that it says in the Torah, the most minutest points. The jots, the tittles, everything in the Torah you do. And he says, yes, everything in the Torah, but, I knew there was a but coming there, but there are certain things that Yeshua did do away with. Okay, I figured, you know, it was too good to be true. For example, like what I asked him, and he explained to me that originally in the Torah there was a commandment that before a person eats, that they must wash their hands. And Yeshua came and did away with this, this old ritual, this extraneous ritual. And I said, you know, I grew up as a Pharisee, washing my hands before I eat uh, several times a day, two or three times a day. Every time I went to eat a proper meal, I had to go through the Pharisee ritual of washing the hands. And so I immediately said to him, okay, you're telling me Yeshua did away with this law from the Torah. Where does it say in the Torah that a person must wash their hands before they eat? Because I knew it wasn't in the Torah. Uh, and he, but he was sure it had to be there, and he opens up to Leviticus, and he starts flipping through the pages trying to find it. It had to be in, you know, with all those rituals and sacrifices in Leviticus and Numbers, and he can't find it. And I'm telling him it's not there. And after, after a little while, he believes me and says, okay, well, if this isn't from the Torah then where is it from? And I was raised with this uh, rabbinical practice, and so I knew it wasn't from the Torah. And before I explain to you where it comes from, let me illustrate to you what it actually means to wash the hands. This is a special ritual that the Pharisees practice. And the Pharisee ritual of washing the hands, it begins with a, the Pharisee ritual of washing the hands begins with a special jug that fulfills certain requirements and specifications. And you take that jug, and by the way, if I take a bar of soap and rub it over my hands and put water on them, I have not fulfilled the ritual of washing my hands. I have to use the jug and do specific ritual. The ritual begins, I pour water over my left hand, then I pour water over my right hand, and then I do this a second time. Pour water over my left hand, and pour water over my right hand. And according to some traditions, I do this a third time. I pour water over my left hand, and pour water over my right hand, and I still have not fulfilled the Pharisee ritual of washing the hands because I have not done the most important part of this ritual. And the key part of this ritual I have not done is the blessing that comes after the actual pouring of the water. And the blessing in Hebrew goes as follows, Which translated into English reads, 
Blessed art thou, Lord, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments, commanding us to wash the hands. And this is what Pharisees say every time they eat bread, every time they sit down for a proper meal. They wash their hands and make this blessing. And I actually grew up with this blessing, saying this on a daily basis. And at a certain point, I went to my rabbis and I said, we're saying this all the time, several times a day, where are we actually commanded to wash the hands? If we're making this blessing, commanding us to wash the hands, where is that commandment in the Torah? And I'd already by this point started to study Torah. And they explained to me that there's actually nowhere in the Torah are we commanded to wash the hands. However, the rabbis have uh, made what's called a rabbinical enactment. The rabbis, according to the rabbis, have the authority to make enactments that add new laws to the Torah, add new laws that the people must follow. And these rabbinical enactments, these are called in Hebrew by the Hebrew word takanot. Takanot refers to these rabbinical enactments. That's really a very important concept, takanot. That's something we're going to see again later tonight. So let's everybody, let's everybody say together this word, takanot. Okay, so these takanot are these rabbinical enactments, and the classic example of one of the takanot is the commandment of the rabbis to wash the hands. Well, I asked my rabbi, okay, the rabbis made this enactment to wash the hands. Uh, why are we blessing God for commanding us to do that? And my rabbis explained to me that God has given the rabbis the authority to make these enactments, and by obeying the rabbis, you're indirectly obeying God. Now, I asked, where, where are we... Where did the rabbis given the authority to make these enactments? And they said, oh, stop asking so many questions. <laughs> and actually, we're going to see a little bit later what the real source for that is. And it's, it's uh, quite shocking. But so this, uh, the, the washing of the hands is a rabbinical, one of these rabbinical takanot. And when I explained this to my Torah-keeping Christian friend, he was in shock. He, he, didn't, he couldn't believe it. Because he had been certain this was a law from the old covenant that Yeshua died to set him free from. And when I showed him this is actually a man-made law that the rabbi sat down one day and enacted, he said, okay, well, what's going on here? Let's go back to Matthew 15 and see what's really happening, because he had completely missed this. Is this really reflected in Matthew 15? And we looked at Matthew 15, verses 2 to 3, and there the Pharisees come to Yeshua and they say to him, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Yeshua answered and said to the Pharisees, why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Now, when I read this, it was immediately obvious to me that there's a very sharp contrast here between the tradition of the elders and the commandment of God. The tradition of the elders and the commandment of God are two separate and distinct things. And what Yeshua is saying is that these tradition of the elders, these takanot, these man-made laws of the Pharisees, they are a transgression of the commandment of God. And I realized that my Torah-keeping Christian friend completely missed this because he doesn't know anything about Phariseeism. He hadn't been raised with Phariseeism like I had. And so he didn't understand all these interactions and conflicts that Yeshua was having with the Pharisees. Uh, he reads about these traditions of the elders, and he thinks, oh, that's the Torah. And the commandment of God, maybe that's some type of higher law. He didn't quite understand this because he didn't understand Phariseeism. And I explained to him that in order to understand all these conflicts Yeshua was having with the Pharisees, what he really needs is a crash course in Phariseeism, which you're all about to get right now. I explained to my Torah-keeping Christian friend that the ancient name was Pharisees, and actually Pharisees comes from the Hebrew word pirushim, which means the separated ones. And at the time of the Second Temple, they were separated off from the mass of the nation. Later on, after the destruction of the Temple, they began to take over more and more Jewish institutions, and today they're known, and the modern name is the Orthodox Rabbis or Orthodox Jews. Now, this is something that Orthodox rabbis actually proclaim very proudly, that they're a direct continuation of the Pharisees of Second Temple, Second Temple times. And in fact, in order to be called rabbi, an Orthodox rabbi, a person must have rabbinical ordination from a previous rabbi, and that rabbi from a previous rabbi going back in an unbroken chain all the way back to the Pharisees of the first century. So the rabbis of today are literally a direct continuation, one rabbi to the next, from the Pharisees of the first century. And Phariseeism, ancient Phariseeism, and modern Orthodox Judaism are both founded upon five fundamental principles, five fundamental principles of Phariseeism, which I lovingly call the five iniquities of the Pharisees. Uh, and before we go into the first principle of Phariseeism, which is really the most foundational principle, I want to throw out a question to you. How many Torahs are there? How many Torahs? Very simple question. It's not a trick question, so all right, how many Torahs are there? One. One Torah. But if you're a Pharisee, there are two Torahs, and that's your most fundamental doctrine and belief that when Moses went up to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, 
The Creator revealed to him two separate and distinct revelations, the written Torah and the oral Torah. The written Torah is what you were referring to, the five books of Moses. That was the Torah, the revelation that was written down. However, the second Torah, according to the Pharisees, which is the oral Torah, also known in English as the oral law, and they believe that God revealed to Moses this oral revelation, which was transmitted from Moses to Joshua, and so on and so on, down to the Pharisees of the first century, and even down to the rabbis of today. Now, everything we're going to learn today about Phariseeism is really predicated upon this concept of the oral law, the oral Torah. If we don't understand oral Torah, we're not going to understand anything else about Phariseeism. Everything else flows from that, from that concept. Now, the concept of the oral law is, uh, is really an ancient concept. The first reference to it, first datable historical reference, is an uh, incident from the era of Shammai. Shammai, many of you may have heard of Hillel. Hillel was the uh, author of the Seven Rules of Hillel. His sidekick was Shammai. And an ancient source tells us an incident with a certain Gentile that came before Shammai. Shammai uh, the Gentile said to Shammai, How many Torahs do you Pharisees have? Shammai answered, we Pharisees have two, two Torahs, the written Torah and the oral Torah. So this is an ancient concept that goes back to approximately at least 20 before the Common Era, approximately 50 years before Yeshua's ministry, and really it probably goes back even a few hundred years before that. So this is an ancient doctrine, and really the most fundamental principle of Phariseeism is the theology or the doctrine of the two Torahs, the written Torah and the oral Torah. Now, the Pharisees explain that the written Torah is sort of an outline. They often give the analogy of a, of a lecture. The notes that you're writing down right now, those notes, that's the written Torah. And the actual details, everything I'm saying, that's the oral Torah. And because of this, they, the Pharisees explain that the written Torah is completely incomprehensible without the oral Torah. The oral Torah completes the written Torah and really fills in all the details. You cannot understand the written Torah without the oral Torah, according to the Pharisees. Now, uh, Ferris, the oral Torah has actually, uh, one of the major changes in Phariseeism over the last 2,000 years is that the oral Torah has actually been written down. And today it's written down and contained in four collections of writings. The first one of these to be written down was the Mishnah, which was written down around the year 200 of the Common Era. And it contains a collection of Pharisaical traditions and teachings and practices and customs and laws. And that's really the backbone of the oral law. The next thing to be written down was the Jerusalem Talmud, which was written down around the year 350 of the Common Era. You might think it was written in Jerusalem, but in fact it was written in Tiberias. It was called Jerusalem to give it more prestige. That was written down around the year 350 of the Common Era. And uh, in the Jerusalem Talmud, it contains discussions of when the rabbis said X, Y, Z in the Mishnah, what were they talking about? And it elaborates and discusses and examines the Mishnah. The next thing to be written down is the Babylonian Talmud, which actually was written in Babylon, as, as, it named, uh, as the name implies, around the year 500 of the Common Era. Finally, the last thing to be written down was the Midrash, which was written down over many hundreds of years, from around 200 and uh, up until the year 900 of the Common Era. And these four uh, bodies of writings, these four collections, to, uh, collectively are today what's known as the Oral Law. Even though it was originally oral in the time of Yeshua, it was still oral, today the Oral Law has been written down. And this is really the most fundamental principle of Phariseeism, the doctrine of the Oral Torah. Everything else we're going to hear today about Phariseeism is predicated upon this. The second principle of Phariseeism is the absolute authority of the rabbis. The rabbis have absolute authority on earth to interpret scripture. And this is epitomized by the saying in the Midrash, which we now know is part of the Oral Torah. In the Midrash it says, Even if the Pharisees instruct you that right is left or left is right, you must obey them. Well, what does that mean? Uh, what that means is if the, my rabbis tell me that this is my right hand, I have to obey them. By the way, it doesn't say I have to believe them. I'm allowed to even say and know that the rabbis are factually wrong, but I must obey their authority because they have the absolute authority to interpret scripture. And in fact, when I was growing up, I was told that if uh, the rabbi is wrong, the sin is upon him. But you as the individual believer cannot take the uh, initiative to question the authority of the rabbi. If your rabbi tells you this, you must accept it and follow it. Well, I really had a problem with this when I was growing up with this, and I began to study the Torah, and I began to study the Talmud, the, the oral law, and I could see in the Torah that this was clearly the word of God. In the Torah we read, and Yehovah spoken to Moses saying, and we get to the prophets and we read, thus says Yehovah. It's clearly the word of God, and we get to the Talmud and we read, Rabbi Meir says this, but Rabbi Akiva disagrees and says that. And, and, I, and I looked at this and I said, I, and I went to my rabbis and I said, look, you know, 
One is the word of God. The other is clearly the words of men. Shouldn't we accept the word of God over the word of men, especially since they're not consistent with each other? And my rabbi said, no, absolutely not. Although these things are spoken as the words of this rabbi or that rabbi, the actual content of their words were revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai. And I wasn't convinced, and I, and I came back and I said, look, the way the rabbis are interpreting Scripture in the oral law, the way they're interpreting the written Scripture, uh, is, is just not consistent with what it says in Scripture. And I can, I can read, and I can see that that's not what it says. And my rabbi said to me, and I, and I said to them, shouldn't we reject this oral law and just accept the written Scripture? And my rabbi said to me, no, absolutely not. You mustn't say such things. That's what the Karaites say. And I said, Who? And I, and I investigated and I found out throughout history there had always been Jews who only believed in the written scripture and they were called Karaites. Kara is the ancient Hebrew word for scripture. Karaite is a follower of the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, well, I really had a hard time with this oral law and I just couldn't accept it. And one day one of my rabbis sat down and he said, enough of questioning the authority of the rabbis, Nehemiah. You must accept their authority. And he began to tell me a very famous story, the story of Rabbi Eliezer, which is a foundational story in rabbinical theology. In our next episode, Nehemiah will expose the foundations of rabbinic Phariseeism so that any believer in Yeshua can begin to understand what the Messiah actually delivered his followers from. Join us again next time for episode five in the 10-part series, Raiders of the Lost Book. This is Michael Rood in the Galilee bidding you shalom, peace, and I will see you when the smoke clears.